distinguished luminaries on the stage, esteemed faculty members and my dear students. A very warm welcome to the inaugural session of the Dr. L. M. Singhvi Global Conference on the theme International Law and International Relations. Dr. L. M. Singhvi Global Conference on International Law and International Relations aims to bring together eminent legal scholars in the field of international law and international relations to brainstorm upon the convergence or confluence of IL and IR in various domains of interstate relations. Spread across two days, the conference will witness nine intriguing sessions on a variety of themes, from climate diplomacy to global governance, global trade relations, language of war, politics of peace, and handling of exodus, picking thoughts and perspectives from various incredible minds in the field of IL and IR. To inaugurate the same, we are honored to have with us some distinguished members of the Indian and international legal fraternity, and it's our absolute privilege to hear from them today. To begin, first I would like to call upon Professor Dr. C. Raj Kumar, founding Vice Chancellor, O.P. Jindal Global University, to open with the welcome address. A very good morning to all of you. Um, I know that uh, the students are very anxious about the um, almost the end of the semester and the beginning of the examination. So I want to first thank all the students who are uh, present here to be able to be part of this Dr. L. M. Singhvi Global Conference on International Law and International Relations. Um, as some of you know that um, Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi has instituted an endowment at O.P. Jindal Global University. Yesterday, we had the formal unveiling of the endowment by Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, the Judge of the Supreme Court of India. We also had a, an absolutely inspiring lecture by Honorable Mr. Justice Michael Wilson, Judge of the Supreme Court of Hawaii, on the theme climate change and global justice, the future of the planet. We also had reflections by Professor Jayant Krishnan uh, from Indiana University on philanthropy. And uh, we really had a wonderful um, event uh, marking the unveiling and the formal establishment of the Dr. L. M. Uh, Singhvi or the Singhvi family endowment. Uh, today we are marking the first initiative under that endowment, which is the Dr. L. M. Singhvi Global Conference on International Law and International Relations. I would like to extend a warm welcome to uh, the individuals who are present on the dais, especially Honorable Miss Justice Geeta Mittal, former judge and uh, Chief Justice of the High Court of Jammu and Kashmir, as well as former Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court, a very distinguished uh, jurist and uh, somebody I have uh, publicly said that the Supreme Court of India lost having her as a judge. So we're very delighted to have you, ma'am, uh, on campus, and thank you so much. Uh, she's, of course, returning to our campus um, after the pandemic. Her last visit was before the pandemic. I also want to extend a warm welcome to Honorable Mr. Justice Michael Wilson, Judge of the Supreme Court of Hawaii, Honorable Mr. Justice Matthew Cooper, uh, former Judge of the Supreme Court of New York, um, Melissa Cooper, who is his wife, who's also uh, been an entrepreneur in the U.S., uh, and, of course, Professor Jayant Krishnan, who I mentioned before. Uh, the conference has been conceived with a view to identifying some of the key and critical issues in international law and international relations. I'm grateful to my colleague and friend, Professor Srijit, uh, the executive dean of Jindal Global Law School, who, along with his colleagues, have painstakingly worked for the last several months to put together this conference. As you can see, the thematic sessions uh, that will be covered is wide-ranging, and I will leave Srijit to formally introduce some of these themes later. But all I can say is that the conference has some of the most outstanding minds who work in the field of international law and international relations. It's also organized at a time when uh, there have been serious and significant attacks to international law and our efforts to build international rule of law. Um, if there is one thing that young people like you need to be committed to as you help build the future is that how can we build a culture of compliance and respect for the rule of law, both domestic and international. While domestic rule of law, rule of law is also uh, challenged as we speak, uh, we need to take more concerted efforts to look at how we can build structures, institutions, procedures, processes, and mechanisms that will enable 
the adherence to the international rule of law uh, through not only uh, the normative framework of international law, but to what extent international relations can actually build and help the enforcement of international law. With those words, I would like to once again extend a warm welcome to all of you. I'm so delighted several of our faculty members are present here. I am grateful to Professor Ambassador Venu Rajamani, Professor Prabash uh, Ranjan, and many others who I see here in the room here who will be speaking and also uh, sharing their ideas and perspectives in the next uh, uh, couple of days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rajkumar. May I now call upon Professor Dr. S.G. Shijit to, to introduce us to the theme of the conference. So good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us today morning. The theme of this conference is international law and international relations, confluence and convergence. It's actually the latter part, the confluence and the convergence, which have actually made the central theme of this conference, even though it's passed off as a sub-theme. Now, this conference basically uh, tells the story of two disciplines, international relations and international law classically found each other in the frontiers of each other, in constant interaction with each other, but all the time they respected the disciplinary boundaries. For IL, international law has always been a subject matter of their analysis. Whereas for international law, there was a conscious effort to resist any incursions from international relations because international law always feared that permission to international relations into the imaginations of international law would actually corrupt the sense of legalism within international law. So IR, we understand a liberal discipline which drew heavily on social sciences. Whereas international law all the time uh, tried to maintain its exclusivity. The exclusivity of being a positive discipline and inclusive uh, positivism of legalism which always they try to keep as their goal. Now, as I've mentioned in international relations discourses, international law has always been a subject matter. Whereas for international law, you know that international, international relations was actually something which they always tried to resist. And for all the time, international lawyers used the excuse of Article 38.1, the statute of IC, the ICJ, uh, which kept international law apart as a branch of law uh, away from all the nasty uh, politics which happened in that. Uh, so the Article 38.1 has always been used as an excuse by international lawyers to resist that incursion of the political, the political into the imaginations of international law. And it always tried to explain a state behavior uh, using, uh, you know, normative inputs. But all the same time, there was actually a kind of desire on the part of the international lawyers that had we got methods and materials like international relations, probably we would have been able to better explain or better predict, uh, better predict uh, state behavior. Now, this conference actually tries to speak about a transformation this happened of late. That means sometime towards the late 1980s, there were some waves of change. And these waves of change initially were felt, but then it was not openly acknowledged until Robert Kuhane, uh, the professor of political science in Harvard Law School, wrote his book After Hegemony, where he said that now states cannot exist without political, without being political, without embracing the political. And in 1989, a young international lawyer, 32 years old, wrote a book from Apology to Utopia in which he concluded that international law here and after will have to embrace that inevitability of politics. And that age-old dictum by critical legal theory is that all international law is nothing but politics finally became a self-fulfilling prophecy. From then onwards, there was actually the dispelling of the dark matter between international law and international relations. From an ice cold rejection, there was a bone crushing embrace. But still there was resistance in some corners because some people were not really happy. So they started to create their own cosmologies trying to resist this confluence. But then the confluence was inevitable. The confluence indeed happened. This conference will mainly try to capture that transformation that once the disciplines which considered as alien to each other, or rather which tried to resist each other, or which were just a matter of curiosity for each other, how they have become good bedfellows, how they have actually started to collaborate with each other and uh, considered each other as desirable partners. Now, 
uh, this conference, as I've said, will primarily focus on uh, this transformation. But more than that, it, there are also sessions where we are going to talk about that acceptance which happened from the sides of both the disciplines. That what they went through in order actually to reach that point where they accepted. And post-acceptance, there was a larger level of reorganization. And most of these reorganizations happened within international law rather than in international relations. Because in 2005, uh, the two uh, uh, American gentlemen came together and wrote a book, The Limits of International Law, in which they said that we are going to here and after accept that the the, the, politic, the political, which you still then considered as your extremate, decaffeinated neighbor, that person is, or that political is now going to be the central imagination of international law. So international lawyers accepted the self-interest of the states as uh, something that drives state behavior. Now this transformation uh, from the classical international law's perspective is not something uh, which is uh, certainly desirable. However, the search for alternatives within certain corners of international law continued all during the time. Now today, international law and international relations have become a paradigm. It has become an analytic. This conference would like to see how, post this confluence and the convergence of the two disciplines, how the drama of global politics has unfolded in diplomacy, in advising, and in decision making. The conference will also focus, hence, how this drama has unfolded in uh, areas like climate change, uh, trade, arms control and global security. We'll be preparing a report at the end of the conference, uh, uh, primarily based on the inputs we are going to, going to gain uh, of the different discussions which will happen in this conference, and we would be happy to release that. But of course, we are not the first one to talk about this convergence. American Journal of International Law uh, in 1996 celebrated by uh, releasing a special issue on international law and international relations. But we would like to see that how before the ugly realities before us, how this kind of confluence is going to help us handle this, or are they going to make things worse? That would be the subject matter of deliberation for the next couple of days. Welcome you all to this conference, and thank you very much for all my colleagues who helped me uh, in putting this concept note together and also in organizing this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shijit. With great pleasure, may I now invite Honorable Justice Geeta Mittal, former Chief Justice of the High Court of Jammu and Kashmir, to deliver the inaugural address. Professor Rajkumar, Judges Michael Wilson and Matthew Copper, Professor Jayant Krishnan, Professor Srijit, Professor Patnayak, Mrs. Melissa Cooper, Ambassador Rajamani, dear faculty and dear students, a very good morning to all of you. It is such a pleasure and privilege to be a guest of honor at this conference and to large, most importantly, to be back at your campus after almost three years. It's something which I deeply cherish. And as always, I never fail to be even more awestruck at what more has developed and what more has happened at your campus. In my address today, I will be discussing issues surrounding the understanding of gender. I am sorry, it's not international. I didn't have time to go international, but in our legal system. So I will examine the interplay between gender and the law. Those of you who have been seeing the Constitution of India, I wonder if you have noticed that the Indian Constitution does not contextualize or refer to gender. It refers to sex in Article 15 and most of the statutes which are relating to gender issues are also confined in the narrative and discourse of sex alone and not gender other than the recent Transgender Act after the pronouncement by the Supreme Court. We all know that gender and sex do not have the same meaning. Sex refers to biological attributes such as reproductive anatomy, with male and female being the primary categorizations. Gender, on the other hand, goes far beyond physiological specifics and refers to social attributes which are contextually developed over a period of time, leading to gender-specific norms and expectations. Gender differences are, however, universally conceded in historical and comparative social analyses to be variants that are transformed over time and from one culture to the next as societies change and evolve. Sex and gender can be in conformity with each other when the lived experience 
of an individual is in line with the sex they were assigned at birth but this is not always the case as we all know now a few words on the women in india discussions around gender issues often adopt a binary heteronormative approach where in the case of india there has been much discussion on making india safer for women however this has not translated into on ground changes and gender based violence continues to rise for instance the ncrb report reported that in 2021 india registered a rise of 26.35 case percent cases of all crimes against women in the last 6 years the government has responded with harsher and more stringent punishments special functionaries and fast track courts however the mindset of the law remains rooted in patriarchal notions with sexual crimes viewed from the moralistic perspective of chastity and disruption of family values as opposed to the individual centric concept of consent this would explain why the law refuses to recognize sexual assault on men and most no- notably why india is yet to criminalize marital rape sexual violence against women is not limited to the domestic sphere given that women are more vulnerable to exploitation for instance i adjudicated a matter before the jammu and kashmir high court where a man was convicted for sexually extorting women asking them for sexual favors under the garb of procuring employment taking note of sex extortion and a concept conceptualized by the international association of women judges it means that the, uh, the sexual exploitation of women by persons in position of authority in jammu and kashmir we passed an order directing the state government to consider introducing a law to make sex extortion a crime this was followed by ac- an actual real time legal recognition of this as a crime so jammu and kashmir is the only place in the world where this the me too movement you know has translated into an actual punishment called sex extortion and also the amendment of the definition of consent in section 375 of the penal code the ranbir penal code in jammu and kashmir now the indian penal code wherein obtaining consent by use of authority or inducement is actually considered as not amounting to consent and is pa- and the sexual into inter- uh, the relationship as a result has been pa- made penal as a offense of rape it continues to it's been recognized even after the abrogation of 370 and so jammu and kashmir is unique in the world actually to have sex extortion as a crime and uh, obtaining consent by use of authority as as not um, uh, as not be consensual relationship women who are victims of sexual assault are often subjected to degrading treatment by legal authorities and face barriers in accessing justice there are multiple reports of women finding it difficult to register police complaints being made to undergo outdated medical procedures including even the two finger test which is completely irrelevant among other things the rate of conviction in such cases has also been historically low which leads to further victimization often discouraging women from filing complaints therefore while we have legal provisions in place at least in some reports we need to address attitudinal barriers and procedural barriers in accessing justice as a means of addressing gender based violence in india the place of women in society continues to be viewed from a patriarchal perspective where we continue to hold on to the gendered and discriminatory beliefs to our women and this is reflected completely in our legal system as well we must remember that following uniform universal profe- procedures does not always result in justice hence the advocacy for having vulnerable witness deposition courtrooms use of screens and shields separating the interface between the perpetrator and the victims at least when the victim is accessing the court system now it's also important to remember that gender is beyond the binaries of men and women when it comes to sex indian laws such as those relating to marriage adoption inheritance succession and welfare legislations have a wide range of provisions which are applicable to males and females in distinct ways but while sex holds significant relevance to indian laws gender on the other hand does not as i pointed out to you the indian constitution does not use the word gender for instance the surrogacy regulation act 2021 the assisted reproductive technology regulation act very recent of 2021 
only recognize legally married Indian males and females and uh, who are recognized to the exclusion of single men, women and other gendered communities including gender fluid, gender non-confirming and the wider LGBTIQ community. There is a huge social disadvantage of the othering. Lack of integration of gender diverse interests and needs in Indian law and jurisprudence can further compound social disadvantages which members of varied gender groups have to suffer. This includes gender disparities in employment, family life, health, education, the environment, public life and decision making. Additionally, gender minorities do not only have limited access to capital and resources but also continue to be not, not or underrepresented in the registry or the government's legislative bodies and other crucial sectors affecting public opinion. In India, for instance, only 11.7% of all current judges of the 25 high courts in India are women. Many high courts have never had a woman judge. Jammu and Kashmir saw first, for the first time a woman chief justice when I was sent there in 2018, a first woman judge also in the year 2018. A 2014 report by the International Commission of Jurists has said that, I quote, higher members and greater visibility of women judges can increase the willingness of women to seek justice and enforce their rights through the courts. Further to, be unquote, further to be truly diverse, the Indian judiciary would need representation not only from different gender identities, including trans and non-binary, but also different castes, socio-economic, religious and regional backgrounds to be truly inclusive and representative. It would also mean appointment of judges from doubly marginalized sections to allow for representation of intersectional voices. However, despite the existence of UN declarations and covenants and the Yogya Karta principles, unfortunately, we have limited legislation in this country dealing with rights of gender diverse communities who face extreme stigmatization and discrimination in all fears of society. Non-recognition of their identity denies them equal protection of law, thereby leaving them extremely vulnerable to harassment and violence from across contexts. So what are the recent developments in Indian law? A few words on that. There have been some positive developments in Indian law and, and jurisprudence mostly in better recognizing diverse gender interests. You are all aware of the Navte Singh Johar and others judgment which threw light on the concept of gender identity, delineated its difference from sex assigned at birth. The very recent decisions of the Supreme Court beginning from the triple talaq, sabri mala cases to decriminalizing homosexuality also signifies a tot, uh, towards a growing proactive role of the courts in ensuring gender, ju gender justice. Decriminalization of adultery was another step forward in addressing gender stereotypes which is embedded in current laws. Indian law also evolved to address the needs of the wider LGBTQ community. Whereas in the case Puttaswami case, the Supreme Court highlighted how the sexual orientation of each individual in society must be protected on an even platform. Uh, similarly, in the Suresh Kumar Kaushal vs. Nas Foundation, the court while demanding non-discrimination in protecting the identity of every individual pointed towards the right of such communities to dwell in privacy and dignity. The landmark Nalsa judgment of 2014 the rec mark the recognition of transgender persons as the third gender, gender and aimed to provide for protections of this community. It promoted gender identity as one of the most fundamental aspects of life and read through various provisions of the Indian constitution which extended rights and privileges of the constitutional protection to transgenders. However, the court has restricted the understanding of fluidity in gender identity to those identities which were already culturally prevalent in the Indian social context, passing over other forms of gender and sexual identities. Needless to say, it is imperative for us to realize that individuals confirming to such identities are provided with the protection and welfare measures and this judicial pronouncement was undoubtedly an advancement over the prevailing legal discourse on gender. However, please note that the understanding of gender itself was limited insofar as it did not consider the broader gender discourse 
and failed to include within its ambit several other forms of gender identities and continued to as ascribe to the male female gender binary with some room for transgender persons furthermore even though it was aimed at empowering empowerment of transgender community this has not been realized on paper pursuant to the judgment in 2019 the parliament enacted the transgender persons protection of rights act but it failed to extend adequate protections most notably the act provides one uh, for a one umbrella offense which includes any and all criminal acts against transgender persons with a common punishment for all such acts this is extremely worrying when we contrast this punishment with those in similar statutes say for instance as those made for protection of women accordingly even when the law recognizes gender to some extent it does not provide for adequate measures for the protection of gender minorities when you look at the nc data the ncrb reports show that only one case was registered under this 2019 act in 2020 and only seven in 2021 so if you look around you and see how inclusive have we become have you ever seen a transgender person studying in class with you have you ever seen them in school in college have you ever seen them performing any kind of employment and these are the kind of issues that you must engage with and uh, think about and ensure that we can create a more inclusive society for us to have a well developed understanding of gender the legal system as a mo whole must most progressively advance the enactment of this act has not been accompanied by attendant updates for other laws relevant to gender identities inheritance of transgenders is not recognized compelling such persons to choose between their gender identity and availing their rights so legal discourse on gender can move truly progressively forward in on, uh, only if we in engage in holistic development of the prevalent legal fr frameworks in so far as they take gender into consideration to truly recognize and provide for non traditional gender identities the legal system the statutory scheme must be made most sensitive and responsive to the needs of such individuals to enable them to lead their lives uh, with equal rights and protection under the law so i think we can all agree that we need a more progressive understanding of gender and sex within the statute scheme and the legal system India can learn much from the international community which has placed gender at the intersection of various social development goals gender equality is an important sustainable development goal and various UN bodies have released a statement which is captioned ending violence and discrimination against the lesbian gay bisexual transsexual and transgender and intersex people which is framed which frames discrimination against these individuals as a violation of international human rights law and an imp impediment to achieving sustainable development goals in its specific recommendations including recognizing the lgbti status as a ground for asylum repealing laws that criminalize people and quote on the basis of their sexual orientation gender identity or gender expression and prohibiting discrimination against lgbti adults adolescents and children in all contexts including in education employment healthcare housing social protection criminal justice and in asylum as well as detention settings unquote so this these this is what we have to address in the absence of indian law india can further adopt from inter international conventions Uh, like the universal declaration of human rights and the yogyakarta principles on the application of international human rights law in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity please remember there is no restriction in your using these international principles in uh, in whatever discourse and which whatever format you may like to engage in even in writing judgments for instance while addressing the migrants from kashmir i had no legal document no statute to fall back on other than the guiding principles framed by the on uh, in internal displacement framed by the un agencies to rely upon 
and e while examining the rights of internal internally displaced persons so please take a this is for the students i'm sure the faculty will guide you we have very able professors i just heard professor srijit and i'm extremely impressed by what uh, he has uh, by his opening words on the manner in which you need to use and fr adopt international principles international covenants international deliberations in your debates in your discussions in your application of the and interpretation of indian laws for the low legal ecosystem to be more just it has to be gender perspective uh, gender sensitive while lawmakers and institution builders have a pertinent role to play in this so do we all of us as students of the law have a responsibility to educate ourselves to make justice more gender inclusive all of you as teachers students the future of indian law have a huge responsibility towards this end thank you thank you honorable justice mittal for your insights and for being an inspiration for us we are honored to have with us honorable justice michael d wilson judge supreme court of hawaii usa may i invite honorable justice wilson to deliver the presidential address aloha some of you have heard me say that before it is i can't tell you just how exciting it is to be back here after the pandemic and say aloha to uh, what is sort of my home you know so home to all of you but i've been coming here for years and learning from the vision of jindal and aloha is essentially the same thing as namaste you know it recognizes the beauty of the human spirit and this room contains a lot of beauty i've been in it not enough but a lot and you are all magnificent so thank you for being here so many of you have decided to attend this uh, discussion i even knowing that you're in the exam period so thank you thank you very much for being here with that said let's turn to this idea of uh, international relations and international law with respect to an issue that could make it pretty darn personal because one of the great things about speaking in this room is almost always the people are under 40. so there's real traction if you're talking about the most important issue facing humanity that to a certain extent isn't nearly as important if you're over 40 because those of us, I am, I'm over 40. I know it's probably a question you had in your mind. So I won't be here in 40 years, but all of you will. So in any case, what's the most important issue facing humanity, bar none? And I'll talk about what the Secretary General of the United Nations has been saying for the last 36 hours. It makes this idea of international relations and international law your issue. If I could, I'd say forget everybody around you. Today we're talking about you and your future. Is there anything more powerful to speak about? You and your future. If somebody was going to snatch your future instead of in terms of food security, energy security, that would get your attention, particularly if you're going to be a parent. Or if there was a path towards a really exciting future, which I will talk about despite what's happening with this idea of climate change. So how many of you uh, have heard about or are a part of the final stand. Okay. I see we have a member of the final stand here. Another member of the final stand. Why do I mention that? The final stand grew out of Jindal Global University Law School. The final stand makes a statement about international law and international relations because it says, okay, we understand we're up against it in the future if you're under 40 the chances of having the world not heat up to two degrees are probably not very good but there is a way to do it 
and we're going to make a final stand during this limited period that you have that might be a decade or a little less than a decade. So if we could go to this slide just for a minute, because I'm talking about an issue that's truly global. Oh, good. I have uh, control. Thank you. Truly global, climate change, international law, and international relations and remedies. Okay, this is where I'm from. And we, in Hawaii, often think about India for the reasons that you've come with your Supreme Court, with your intellectual leadership that includes Justice Middle. I, should I say judge? Or I always like to think of you on the Supreme Court. But anyways, Justice Middle and her colleagues on the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Takar, Chief Justice Chandra Chud, have been to Hawaii, all of that being engineered in a way, if you will, by Professor Dean Kumar. So we have, even though we're the most remote landmass on the earth, and we have 1.4 million people, which is, how many people, how many lawyers do you think there are in India with 1.4 billion? You have the same population of lawyers, 1.4 million, that we have in our whole state. So we're not that big, but we're kind of interesting. So this is the point at which I invite you to come to Hawaii. I'll go out of my way to meet you at the airport. That sounds a little strange because you don't know how I perceive you. I think of each of you as, hey, potentially one of the leaders in the world that's going to make this idea of international relations and international law merge around your private need to survive. In 40 years, that beach will be gone. That's a famous beach. This is a picture of Hawaii that's spread around the world. And so things will change fundamentally. And they'll change in part because of, see, this is, if you don't remember anything else about your future, think about how in 40 years, according to the leading atmospheric scientists in the world, a professor at Cambridge, over 100 million people are going to leave Bangladesh. That will be the period of the destabilization. What's going to prevent that from happening? It's not just going to be a fence. Certainly isn't necessarily going to be military might, we hope. What will protect Bangladesh and India, but more importantly you? The rule of law, the international law, international relations. So let's talk a little about international relations. How many of you recognize this person? Raise your hand. OK, well, this is a really important day, because for the first time, you see the Secretary General of the United Nations, who has as one of his primary responsibilities, in his view, you. So when he was giving a speech last December at Columbia, when I say he was talking about you, he was focused on future generations. And he said, no, think about how many of you have heard of the pandemic? Raise your hand. Fantastic, because this is a school that I think is global, and you probably know we had a pandemic, especially since you couldn't come to school. OK, we're on the same page and something that's really important. And the Secretary General said, even though it was an unprecedented threat in terms of human health, we conquered it. We came together internationally, came up with the vaccines and a solution. But as much as a threat as it was to humanity, he says it pales in comparison it's not as important as a threat to your future from climate change. When he said that, it was in December. Now he was talking about you in the last three days. How many of you know that there's an international relations coming together of great significance called the COP? Raise your hand. OK, great. Well, those of you that aren't familiar with the COP, it's a conference of the parties put together by the United Nations in Egypt in order to address what issue? Climate change, exactly. So he addressed it. He gave a speech. And looking at it in terms of the Paris Agreement, right, in 2015, that said to protect your generation, the Earth can't heat up to 1.5 degrees. He was quite concerned in December. but. Within the last two days, he said that we are on a 
climate change highway, and he said, this highway pertains to the most important issues facing humanity, and he named three of them. One was food, hunger. Another was just general chaos. And the third was war. He's, he's emphasizing how important and immediate this is. And he said this is a pathway to hell. It's a pretty powerful term to have the Secretary General of the United Nations say in relation to international relations. We have Ambassador Rajamani here. I don't think that that's the language of the ambassadorial vocabulary. It's pretty extreme, and this is one of the most powerful em uh, emissaries as an ambassador in the world, the Secretary General. That was a pretty powerful statement, and it was one that makes a difference in terms of analyzing international relations and international law. So let's talk a bit about international law. How is it different than international relations? A lot of it depends on you, young people. What are you going to resort to if you consider you don't have much time? Impending s solution horizons maybe 10 years when you have s time to do something about it. And there's a 1.5 degree threshold that's an existential threat according to international government, inter inter intergovernmental panel on climate change or if you look at the position that's being taken by the cops that have been uh, convening in the last decade. 1.5 degrees is a threshold, but what we are headed towards now is three degrees, destabilization, and the washing away of, this is the beach we'll take you to in Hawaii, this is our major beach, and we would lose the kind of core economic engine for Hawaii when the speech gets washed away in 40 years. So let's turn to this idea of environmental law because in the context of the law, this is the most important issue facing judges. And I've had the great fortune to spend time throughout the world community with judges addressing this issue, trying to make sure that we have a solution within the next 40 years so the rule of law doesn't suffer and disappear. And so here we are. What do judges do? They have to figure out how to contend with this emergency. And who is it that's responsible for bringing the issues? Well, if you are dealing with international law and you're somebody that went to Jindal Global Law School, you could be one of the attorneys that brings actions to protect your generation. And is that happening? It's happening in a way that I guess I would say is florid. It's robust. It's exciting in the sense that the issue about whether you have a right to a stable climate capable of supporting human life is before the courts. And the judges have to come up with a solution once they decide your right is being violated. So we need a solution, and we don't have one as yet. There's a big gap in terms of what are you going to do to keep the Earth from heating up to 1.5 degrees. So we, it is one of those existential issues, a lot like what virus is going to be picked how are we going to deal with the pandemic? This is even more important because you're not facing a virus. You know, you're f facing a destabilization where the world economy is going to shrink. So let's get back to the rule of law. It is such a powerful tool. And you have the opportunity to use that tool in a way that will fill the vacuum. What would a solution look like? In the next three minutes, I'm going to speak to you a bit about a solution that I would like to think of is a Jindal global international relations slash law solution. We can't have international relations like we have now, right? The international relations have led us to the point where you've got an extraordinary change in wealth 
Imagine since the pandemic, if you were a billionaire, you got 20% on your investment, that's $200 million. You have $200 million more than you did before the pandemic. If you look at it just in terms of the issue of climate change, there's been record profits, not $200 million, $200 billion record profits since the pandemic. So there's a vast amount of funds available. And if there is a climate solution, let's say, for example, the rainforests aren't supposed to be burned. Let's say, for example, we're supposed to move to electric energy for transportation. Or let's say, for example, we aspire to a macro level solution that's de developed in India, because you have the intellectual capacity from terms of science and law to do this. A solution that says we're going to refreeze the Arctic, maybe with thousands of robot ships that put vapor into the air so that you can reflect light back into space. These are solutions that need a commitment to international relations from young people. Like, how many of you have heard of Greta Thunberg? OK. How many of you have heard of Disha Ravi? Okay, Disha Ravi is 22 years old, was recently uh, uh, arrested, but she's an activist from India. That's the kind of leadership that can affect international relations now in a way that Barack Obama said is necessary when he gave a speech at the COP in November. He said, to you, he was talking to the younger generations, he said, I'm sorry, the governance systems, whether you're talking about Congresses, parliaments, you're talking about decisions by the executive branch. You're talking about the systems of diplomacy under the United Nations like the cops are not working. If your solution needs to come from you, it needs to, he said, young people have to vote like their life depends upon it because it does. So you have to be organized in a way that the final stand recognizes. An organically grown group of young people from India who've connected with young people Internationally, the group of young people that are behind a most important climate case in the United States. Interesting, international. You've got the final stand here, and you've got this international group that comes from the United States, our Children's Trust, and that's what can create a powerful international relations policy that can be translated into international law. And to some extent, it's probably a reason why your Supreme Court has become a leader on this, because as you probably know, the right to life under your Constitution has been translated into the right to a clean and healthy environment. And it was one of the first decisions of a Supreme Court to do so. But you have to add the momentum. You have to create that kind of understanding that it's okay and it's, it's necessary to share the kind of massive profit that's being created in the world through our energy policies and then be able to transition to a system that allows us to keep the earth from heating to 1.5 degrees. So let me thank you for uh, having me here. I'll conclude with uh, some of my favorite, sli my favorite slide here. This is it. This is you, and you can succeed. You can succeed because you have the law that can protect you. You have international relations that can protect you so that you end up not on the left, where Mahatma Gandhi was when he was facing England, not on the left where Martin Luther King was in the United States when he was facing racism and bigotry, but on the other side, India is the giant now, and that's you. In the United States, we've also transitioned. So we need to transition so that when you go into a bar, like you in the United States and you want to smoke, it's completely unacceptable culturally. When you come to India and you want to harvest fossil fuel, you want to burn fossil fuel, you want to put fossil fuel into the air that's already the air of New Delhi, put it into the air of a country where young people are dying in, in big numbers because of heat and the heat will continue to go up, 
You'll see it's culturally unacceptable just like it is when you go to a bar and smoke because we, you know, the older generation have decided along with you, we're going to protect you and it's not correct any longer to take action that keeps you on the left. What we have to do is make future generations as important as we made race relations. Make it as important as we made when it comes to the very, very critical issues of our day that have to do with economic distribution. I think it can happen, and I think when it happens, it's very likely it'll happen because of somebody in this audience or from Jindal Global University, which in many ways is the most intellectually powerful university law school in India, but finally because your power and your strength and the reason this has become such a noted educational institution, not just in India where it's a number one law school, but in the world is because of character and values. Don't forget, you carry with you the integrity and the moral strength of future generations and the planet. And that can mean you end up on the right side and you're the giant in control of good values that doesn't allow the poisoning in the earth and of course your children in the future. So that's the end of my obsessive presentation and I'll say aloha and namaste and I look forward to speaking to all of you in the next day or so while we're here. Thank you, Honorable Justice Wilson, for this interesting presentation and talk. We are very happy to have the presence of Honorable Justice Matthew F. Cooper, former judge, Supreme Court of New York. I would now like to invite Honorable Justice Cooper to deliver his special address. Uh, like my friend, the Honorable Michael Wilson, who I've actually known for so many years. We went to law school together, so he's Mike to me. I also come from an island nation. Mine's Manhattan in New York City. And so unlike if you're from Manhattan, you don't say aloha. You say, hey, how you doing? So it's such a, and we also went, I also extend an invitation to all of you to come to Manhattan. But unlike someone from Hawaii, you don't say, I'll come and pick you up at the airport. I'll tell you, take a cab or an Uber. <laughs> and by the way, how many people have been, to New have been to New York City? Hey, so it's a pretty good, pretty good uh, representation of people who have traveled from uh, India to the US. I would say it's an incredible thrill to be here, to be back at Jindal, to be up here with this incredible panel, and to be here with your Vice Chancellor and Dean Raj Kumar, who I have to say is not only a visionary, but, and I've been in lots and lots of schools in my time, lots of universities, he is clearly the most hardworking man, hardworking person in education. So it's always such a thrill to be here with him. And it's a, And it's a special pleasure to be back here when I think about all that has happened over the last two and a half years. I was going through my papers and I found this. It's the, it was a conference where I spoke at Jindal. It may have been in this very room, educating the future lawyer, the role of the law schools and the legal profession in India. It was the plenary session, the vice chancellor's round table. Guess what day it was? It was Friday, 13th of March, 2020. And if I'm not mistaken, that was probably the last program to be held live and in person before the, sh yeah, probably the last one in the world. We actually, my wife and I, Melissa, we left India on the 14th. If we hadn't been on that plane, I'd be living on this campus, right? So, which wouldn't have been bad, but I had to get back to be a judge. So it's good that we, you know, it was, it was good that we made that plan. But then two and a half years of this incredible pandemic, sometimes it seems like it couldn't have happened. But what's great to see, Raj, is that things didn't stand still at Jindal. Pandemic didn't stop it. Instead, there was virtual programs. They, they, Jindal was in the forefront of switching to virtual education. I know I uh, appeared in a number of uh, programs from, the, from New York. I remember 
if you had a program here that was at three three in the afternoon, I mean, I had to get up at four in the morning. But other, but it was it was incredible to do that. And look what's happened to this campus. We had a tour when we just got here. Why the pandemic was on with things shut down. We just didn't sit. They didn't sit. Things didn't sit still. in OP Jindal, they expanded, built, and the school looks even more spectacular than it ever has. So congratulations. One of the things I'm struck by OP Jindal, and I saw this last night when I was at a program, and I saw up there, I saw what there was a one of these big banners, and it had some mottos for OP Jindal. We always know it bills itself as India's first global law school. But it also proudly proclaims that it's a private university promoting public service. And that's a big, big thing that makes this school different. And one of the things you do that makes it both global and promoting public service, you send people off to, on an internship to all sorts of interesting jobs, to all to courts. I know a lot of people have gone to Hawaii to be with Michael's Supreme Court. One of my big disappointments, and the only the really biggest disappointment I have of my experience here at, at Jindal was because of the pandemic, I had five students that were going to come to New York State Supreme Court, and they couldn't do it because of the pandemic. I'm now retired, so you no longer have the opportunity to intern with me, but my former law clerk, Joanne Quinones, is a judge in Kings County. You know what Kings County is? Kings County is Brooklyn. Have you all heard of Brooklyn? Yeah, Brooklyn's more famous now than Manhattan. So it's, and it's a very, very cool place. And there may be a very good chance that Joanne would be able to do, in, uh, Judge Kinnos could do interns and you could get to see New York at its, yeah, I say New York at its most frantic, New York at its coolest, Brooklyn, New York. So that's an opportunity I hope you will be able to have. When we talk about Jindal as a public service school, a school that promotes public service, and I connect it to international law, this is my thought. You know, the, when we think about international law, we often think about it first as commercial litigation and co corporate transactions and trade treaties, all those things as important as they are, commercial litigation, corporate, as important as they are, that's not the law that affects everyday people all the time. And international law does affect people because it affects, and there is a, the aspect of international law I want to talk about that affects regular everyday people and their families is, that, is well, actually, before I get to that, I just want to just state my, Mike made it very clear that international law isn't just corporate, isn't just transactions. It's, at this point, existential. It's the existential issue of our time as we fight the threat for our very real, uh, up to our very real existence, our very existence from global warming. And Justice Mattel pointed out, international law deals with something that should be of vital importance to everybody, gender discrimination gender equality. The part I want to talk about, very briefly, because I know you have so many different people you need to hear from today, is when I was in the court system, I spent a lot of my time doing family law, divorce law. So I want to talk about the effect that international law and international institutions have on family law, and particularly on child custody, which is global in its dimensions. As a judge, I dealt with more and more uh, contentious international custody cases. And this was, as the 20 years I was on the bench, I saw this more and more. Why? Because people move uh, freely from country to country nowadays. Same way we're here, and I saw so many of you said you've been to, you've been to the United States. People go back and forth between borders. People from many uh, people from many pe uh, from countries move to different countries. They don't just travel, they live. People marry people from different countries. People, and finally, people have children that travel to and from and live in different countries. And when there's a divorce or a parental separation, you then have conflict 
over one parent taking the child or even visiting to another country. And even more serious, we have the situation where one parent will take a child and abscond with that child to another country. That becomes an incredibly difficult situation for courts to deal with. However, this is where international law comes in. Countries have come together. They've come up with the Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Childhood Abduction. I know we have ambassador, the former ambassador to the Netherlands. They're very familiar with all the Hague Conventions. The one I dealt with most was the Hague Convention on Childhood Abduction. And what it did, it formed an international Hague network of judges. And this is what you see internationalism at its best. There's a group of 175 judges from all over the world who work together. They don't work just as from what, this is my country and this is what we do here. They work together. So it's, it's judges from various countries who are experts on the convention and the international family law issues. The networks facilitate communication between judges in different countries and they serve as a general resource. Source. And I've seen how this works. I've seen how when there's an issue involving a child in another country and there's a question of how, where should, which, with, with, with which parent should the child be with or what should be the circumstances, what country is going to take jurisdiction? Through this use of the Hague Convention and the National Hague Network of Judges, litigation can, can proceed smoothly and fairly to a just result. I do have to point out, this makes it a little controversial, India, for various reasons, is not a signatory to the, international Hague, uh, to the Hague Convention on Civil Aspects of International Childhood Ab Abduction. I've read the reasons. I understand them. I'm hoping that pretend as potentially that will change in the not too distant future. So my words for you here at Global, uh, here at Global, here at OP Jindal Global University, particularly OP Jindal Global Law School, a international school, a school that looks forward, a school that is, as I've heard over and over again, is enlightened and productive and progressive, and I've seen it. Here's my words for you. One, be global. Two, dedicate yourself to public service. And I might add three, urge India to sign on to the convention. Right? Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Honorable Justice Cooper. May I now invite Professor Dr. Jayant Krishnan Milton Judy Stewart, Professor of Law, Indiana University, USA, to address the gathering. So I just want to say uh, thank you to uh, JGU for allowing me to say a few words about the role of international law and international relations as it relates to work being done at our Stewart Center on the Global Legal Profession at Indiana University Bloomington, which I have the privilege of directing. Uh, one of the areas that I hope receives attention during these next two days is the topic of immigration, which we at our Stewart Center at Indiana have come to see as being at the heart of both domestic but also international relations policy. I'm currently working with my colleagues in Indiana, the great anthropologist, Professor Sarah Friedman, and the equally renowned sociologist, uh, Professor Erit Deckel. And so what I'll be speaking on here draws upon a concept paper that the three of us have crafted that deal with issues that intersect with today's conference. So as I look at the program for this wonderful conference, uh, I see a brilliant group of interdisciplinary uh, scholars who are broadly concerned with questions of justice in an unevenly mobile world. In the face of polarized political discourse and widespread anti-immigrant sentiment, we see politicians in the United States and in India uh, and across other diverse countries around the globe decrying 
out of control immigration and immigration policies that are run amok. These officials have called for heightened restrictions to resolve perceived crises at the border. And this hostility to variously defined others traverses the political spectrum within liberal democracies, and it bridges, unfortunately, democratic and autocratic regimes. And so what we see are deep consequences for rights, equity, and belonging. And as a result, these global trends require analytical and normative interventions by scholars, policy activists, government officials, and civil society researchers across disciplinary boundaries, which is what I know we'll be seeing at this conference we have here. Because what we've been witnessing within the international relations sphere is a demonizing political rhetoric, which has obscured the fluidity of national borders that naturally contract and expand. And it does so in what the professor from the University of Toronto, Ayelet Shachar, had describes as being done in a quantum-like fashion. And the political response to immigration policies that manipulate space, time, and the luck of the birthright lottery contribute to deep inequalities that are continuing to be f being forged within and between groups. Moreover, our definitions of desirable and undesirable migrants and would-be citizens also continue to fluctuate within these shifting borders, bestowing on some groups a host of rights and entitlements, while I'm afraid depriving others of fundamental guarantees to human well-being. And so what does justice mean in a world where margins and centers are constantly redrawn as borders cut through, bleed into, and push outward? with hierarchies in, of inclusion and exclusion defined by a changing spectrum of characteristics such as nationality, class, sexuality, gender, race, and ethnicity. These are the types of issues that we're focusing on at our Stewart Center at Indiana, and which I'm sure will be part of the imagination here during this conference over the next two days. In fact, I hope that the focus of this monumental conference here will explore how concepts of justice are defined and challenged as people move across borders and think about belonging across space and time. In other words, how do unequally situated groups advocate for and put into practice various understandings of justice? What are the attendant models of equity, rights, and belonging that inform these definitions of justice? Relatedly, what do we learn from diverse justice-seeking subjects about effective responsive, responses to restrictive mobility regimes and potential innovations to align governance ideals with human rights protections? As many of you are students here who are interested in these issues, I would submit that you may want to reflect on these additional questions as a broad guide for your conference over the next couple days. And specifically, I'm talking about the following. How do we think about the role of law in defining what justice means in different state, historical, and institutional settings, especially in relation to border regulation and shifting borders? What different concepts of justice emerge along diverse axes of social and national belonging? What logics support those differences and how are they justified and or challenged? How do reflections on justice affect our understanding of national identity, citizenship, and belonging? What are the contributions of different methodologies when addressing access to and perhaps more importantly, delivery of justice. How do conceptions of justice square with our understanding of what types of rights are needed to protect individuals and groups?
And finally, what are potential consequences for international human rights frameworks and liberal democratic ideals? My expectation is that this conference here will address these and other questions over the next two days. I would hope that you would see this conference as a productive opportunity for generative interdisciplinary conversations that will cum culminate in scholarly publications and publicly accessible products through blog posts or online policy papers, and more broadly to advance our discourse on how to strengthen our rule of law framework in both a domestic and international context. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Krishnan. With this, I would like to call upon Professor W. Sridhar Patnayak, Registrar, OP Jindal Global University, to present the concluding remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Justice Michael Wilson, Justice Geeta Mittal, Justice Matthew Cooper, Vice Chancellor, Professor Raj Kumar, Professor Jayant Krishnan, my dear colleague, Professor Srijit, and Ambassador Rajamani, Professor Prabhash Ranjan, uh, Professor Archana Negi from JNU and uh, Siddharth Malavarpu, Professor from SNU and many other distinguished guests and dear students. Uh, well, it's indeed a historic moment as many of you are aware as remarked by the Vice Chancellor, the conference that we are going to have today and tomorrow is part of uh, our commitment uh, to the uh, Singhvi Foundation and we are so grateful to Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi uh, for having uh, endowed uh, this gift and this contribution and the uh, conference is a terrific contribution uh, and a befitting tribute to the life and times of uh, Dr. L. M. Singhvi, uh, illustrious father of Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi. And uh, what's more, uh, it's also historic for a particular reason on a time scale uh, because in India, if we look at the study of international law, and uh, international relations. Uh, this was started by uh, Pandit uh, Hrudeinath Kunzru and Professor Apadurai and Professor M. S. Rajan uh, way back in the 1960s when they founded the Indian Council of World Affairs and the Indian School of International Studies, uh, later merged with the Jawaharlal Nehru University and that became the School of International Studies and International Law uh, henceforth is being taught and interpreted from this per perspective of IR, meaning which international relations and area studies. And today we have an opportunity to continue with that particular tradition uh, to understand international law, both from the perspective of uh, domestic laws and the Indian perspective, as well as to understand the effect of interstate relations on international law. So I'm so very grateful to my colleague, uh, Professor Srijit, under the leadership of Professor Rajkumar uh, for having curated and convened uh, this wonderful conference and as a good point of departure, uh, the reflections by the justices and Professor Jayant Krishnan set the tone for the conference for the remainder of two days and also there's a powerful message in which we need to understand different perspectives as well as interpretation of the law to only know that the future of international law is domestic. So I appeal to all students to take advantage of this conference which is happening on campus wherein we have distinguished panelists coming from various universities and from the legal profession who are going to be part of this program and who are going to share their perspectives uh, to give a ringside view on the changing landscape of international law. On this particular note, I thank everyone who are involved in convening this conference and we are also grateful to our distinguished guests this morning uh, for having taken out time to be with us and for continuing to inspire us. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Professor Patnayak. Uh, I would like to take an opportunity once again to thank all the dignitaries on the stage for joining us for the inaugural session. With this, we will proceed to the first session titled Being Together, International Law and International Relations, which starts at 11.15 a.m. in the Big Bang Conference Room. We hope to see you all there. Uh, before then, I request all our guests and participants to join us for high tea served at the Big Bang Conference Room. Thank you all.